is a long one. Oh, my Nothing God. but net. Hello and welcome to another episode of All Nat. I'm your host, Natalie, but most people call me Nat. And today, I don't know what I'm getting myself into because it's me versus two war- uh, warriors. Oh my God, I'm the Warriors fan. Two yeah. Celtic <laughs> fanatics. No, no, no. Like, I have two great people with me today. One you've met already, my uh, producer extraordinaire, Derek. Um, he is the man behind OTS Media and also the producer for my show. So, and he's also a big, huge Celtics fan. So, you know, he does not like editing my clips of the show when um, I am talking about the Seas, even though I have mad love for the Seas. But in this series, obviously, my heart is with the Warriors. So, Derek, welcome. Welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me back. Yeah, la- last week's promo uh, definitely irritated me. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cruz is going to write, though, but we'll talk about that. We'll talk about um, that. And then, of course, of course, last but not least, I have my guy, Warren Shaw, who um, is an incredible person. Um, he is the host of the, oh, you see the poster actually in the in the background for you guys, the Baseline NBA podcast. Um, He's also a co-founder of 19 Media Group, who has a bunch of great content going on over there, Black-owned, a lot of different podcasts that I've had the pleasure of being a guest on. Warren is an ally of women in sports who talk sports, and I appreciate him. He's always supporting me, Um, and he covers the Celtics, and he does a great job of doing it and puts out great content. So you should follow Warren. You should follow 19 Media Group. You should follow the Baseline NBA podcast. You should follow all of those things. And Warren will let you know where to find him on everything and to find their content. Warren, welcome to the show. Oh, that was warm as hell. And Derek, I'm going to need that spliced out. We're going to put that out there. That was a nice little drop she gave me right there for 19, the baseline and everything we're a part of. But just happy to be here on your platform. And you've been doing it lovely. And you too as well, Derek, this OTS Media thing. Yo, yo, it's, it's fire, man. So congratulations to you both. Appreciate Thank that. you. So yeah, so you guys are both Celtics fans. Normally I bring like my backup, but I got this. I think I can handle it on my own today. So I was saying before we started recording is two, two to one in terms of you guys versus me, but the series is one, one. And so whoever wins the next game will go up to one. My guess is I know where you guys think who's going to win the next game. I don't think we're going to agree on that, but I really, really do want to get into this series and and what you guys have seen so far. So, and I want to know your prediction. So Give me predictions at the end. I want to know, like, if anything has changed based on what you saw, but we'll get into predictions at the end. So um, it's 1-1. One, one. Um, did anything surprise you so far about the, has anything surprised either one of you so far about how the series has gone? I'm going to consider Warren, like, your guest, because, like, this is kind of home to Derek. So, Warren, I'm going to let you go first. Has anything surprised you so far in the series after the first two games? Surprise, no. Um, I think there are some expectations, and I think I'd say, like a lot of us, think the series was flipped in terms of I expected game one's performance maybe be game two and game two to be game one, where Golden State would kind of blow Boston out just from the experience factor. Um, but I wouldn't say I'm overly surprised, you know, by that. I, I think if if I was going to say something, it's Boston's response <laughs> after you know being handling the pressures of Game One and then getting just mollywopped <laughs> in Game Two, especially in the second half. So that was a little frustrating to watch per se. Um, and you know, again, I don't want to get too far into it, but I think I was a, maybe maybe a little surprised that they allowing Draymond to get into their heads the way they did. Um, but I think again, I think that's a one-time only type of situation. Now that you've seen it, that card can't be played again. Um, but I think that's probably the biggest two things that I saw in the first two games. What about you, Derek? Uh, actually, kind of, I, I agree with you, Warren. I think um, one thing I was I was expecting a split in in. Uh, uh, San Francisco, but I, I was expecting uh, the Golden State Warriors to take the first game. Um, so that's probably the biggest surprise to me, honestly, um, just the order. <laughs> okay, yeah, I think we're all aligned. I mean, 
there were a lot of Warriors fans picking the series in five, which offended, I think, a lot of Celtics fans. But I, I think people thought that was like a lack of respect. And it really wasn't because I don't actually think like, for example, you guys swept the Nets or you guys, the Celtics swept the Nets. But like we did all, the, all those games were close. Right. And so my point is, like, I remember there was a series, the Warriors swept Portland, but like they were down, like in most of those games and had to like come back to win. Right. That was in 2019. So like a series can be really tough and hard and physical, even though like one team wins all the games. And so like when a lot of Warriors, there are some Warriors fans who were just being like, oh, whatever. But most of them, it wasn't like a lack of respect. It was just based on what the Warriors have done so far in the postseason. And that was hold home court. So there was they were making an assumption that they'd be able to, you know, win the first two games at home and then win a game in Boston. And they've done that so far in every series. So, and the only series that won six was the Grizzlies and they didn't have home court in that one. So that was the basis for a lot of people saying five versus six from the Warriors end. But um, I had a feeling the Celtics would probably be one of the teams that would come in and steal a game and chase. So when I was thinking of like what I was predicting the series in, it was like really hard for me because like I don't know I was like that sounds like really rational but my gut is telling me the Celtics are gonna come and take a game and chase so I did also have it splitting those first two games but yes like both of you I thought the Warriors would win game one and then like the Celtics would win game two so I mean in a way if you're a Celtics fan that probably for you guys feels like it bodes well because both of these teams neither have lost two games in a row. So like if in this postseason, so if that continues, then it, it bodes well for the Celtics that they got game one, but um, you know, anything can happen. So that's, that's where we are. So I'd say we're aligned in terms of all three of us in terms of surprises. Um, and then, you know, I was actually a little surprised by how the Warriors chose to defend Jason Tatum in game one right like um I love Jason Tatum so again like this is not like shade to him but I just I didn't think that they needed to guard him you know in the coverages that they were giving him I thought he was someone that they could have put in single coverage and it, it, I don't think that there's anyone on the Warriors who's shutting Jason Tatum down but I just don't think that we needed to send like all those bodies at him and like by doing that it um allowed in my opinion a lot of your um other guys to like get off and get going um because the Warriors were over helping um and and giving Tatum a lot of attention and so while he didn't get going like shooting wise he had like a career high in assists right so that to me that's like the same as <laughs> him shooting lights out it might even be better because he's playmaking and now the other guys get going so I I was surprised at that. Like if that was like something they were going to do, I would have thought that would have been something later in the series. Like if Tatum was killing them, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And I was very surprised to see them break that out in game one. So I was happy that they, they changed that quickly in game two. And um, obviously I felt better about the outcome of the game. Yeah. I, if I'll, I'll jump in real quick. I mean, I think there's, there's part of that, that mentality that you feel like, especially with Tatum um, first time on the stage, you know, I think Kerr was probably like trying to rattle him, you know, in that aspect as well, too. I mean, again, listen, let's let's not play coy. You know, Kerr is is the old school guy. He's going to do some of those tricks, if you will. And again, he just he thinks, hey, this is how I was raised and how's how I coach and things I went through when I was growing up and playing the NBA. These things might work. And I think to some degree, betting on Marcus Smart, Derek Wyatt and, and Al Horford to beat you from three was usually a smart bet. I mean, is it though said, in this postseason? <laughs> I, I mean, I think I think. Usually it is, you know, and you know, Al White, Horford has been like, I, I'm okay with the betting, like Marcus Smart and White, even though White, since he had a kid, don't have no damn sense. But like, <laughs> Al Horford can make threes. Like, I mean, these are still NBA players. Like, you're right. They were, you're they right. were like just leaving them wide open. Like, it but was just like, you don't come think Horford's gonna, he's not gonna bank six threes. You know what I mean? You, like, you know what I mean? It's like, all right, he'll get two or three, but six. Or whatever it was, was it was excessive. And you're right, Derek White has turned into Fred Van Vliet. You know what I mean? <laughs> After having the baby, it feels like, yeah, this is like my new superpower having the son. So um, I think Golden State's game plan in game one was, I don't think it was 
bad. I just, again, it just, it backfired in, in essence. And you got a career, per, career shooting game out of those three guys specifically. And Draymond called it. Hey, they did what they did. And they see them do it again in the game too. But you're right. The coverage is, did switch. Um, and the war, I mean, the Celtics were just not as hot. Um, for, and weren't able to sustain that. And Al Horford, he, I don't know, everyone was joking. It's like he regressed because even when he had stuff on him in the post, he couldn't do anything. I was like, what, what's happening, bro? Like, why, why are you struggling in the, in, the, in the post and on the switches? So when he finally took a shot in the second half, it just, he just didn't have it. And I think that was a big, big, big factor for Boston. He didn't take any threes last night. Yeah, what right. do you think that was about? I mean, I, while I would love to say that Clay played very solid defense on him and he did like I mean what what was what do you think was going on with him I mean to me you still had some advantages on clay that you could have probably tried to you know <laughs> like some mismatches and he just I don't know like go into the post you know um and and see if clay can like do anything to stop you there but he just he wasn't taking advantage of that matchup at all or attempting my, to my assumption is that he just wanted to try and get other guys going like he usually does that's my assumption i but th there also wasn't a lot of play calls for him either yeah i was gonna so, say they weren't like really like, playing through him so i don't really think that you know i like yeah horford is 36 now but i'm not that's that's not really much of a regression thing i think it's just a bad game like guys just have bad games and <laughs> that's what two that's, points that's from how, him two points from was look, it marcus and what like i mean that like Ooh, I, I, well, starters. I'm well. I'm saying for him specifically, I think that was just a that was that was a mixture of of multiple things, bad game, not enough play calling. I mean, that's 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 an adjustment that I think will take place for game three, though. I think we're going to see a little more from him in game three. Okay, yeah. I mean, Draymond has been an interesting character throughout the postseason, right? For a variety of reasons. So. Like, first of all, there's been this whole new, like, new media thing, right? And I kind of would like to know, especially, you know, you, Warren, being like a media member, what are your thoughts on, like, Dre and his new role? Because, I mean, he's, like, in um, shoot-around reporting for TNT. He, the game ends and he goes and he records podcasts. He's on, you know, TNT set after the Warriors win and clinch a finals berth saying the Warriors are going to play the Celtics before um, the series even ends, which apparently upset the Miami Heat and like Draymond was being blamed for why the Celtics <laughs> I didn't lost, love that. I mean, you don't need to give any team another fuel, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's just, I don't know that a lot of players are taking kindly to like, all of his commentary and then a lot of times too because you'll see him like not have a great game and he goes and records and he's like oh well Jason Tatum didn't do this and this person didn't do this and you know he's like recording podcasts and by the way like my whole squad like Andre Iguodala I mean granted he hasn't been around like that but he's re recording his new podcast with Evan Turner they're they're doing spaces and having Jordan Poole in it so I mean the the Warriors players seem to be at the forefront of this I mean I think JJ Redick was maybe the only other player sort of doing something like this Danny Green does too but I'll call them yeah I mean but they would do it like in the off season more right like does McCollum do this during the season he started he started yeah the last couple of seasons he's he has an in season now he just signed with ESPN as well too so he's gonna have a, even a bigger role and in season reporting and stuff like that for him as well too so that's that's the wave Nat honestly you know like 2022 uh, I'm gonna take it way way back I think when we started part of the player empowerment era um I don't know if you remember when Players Tribune kind of bust. Yeah. And like, you know, like, and they were starting to write their own articles and break their own free agency. And that kind of led the way, I think, a little, little by little. Then you okay. had, you know, Up and Smoke podcast and, and every player started to kind of get on their own platform and do their own thing. Draymond is just that times 25. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> of just how boisterous he is in general. But he's so, he is smart and he knows how to poke the bear, if you will. Um, but he also knows what he's talking about. So I, I, it's really interesting to kind of see that, you know, and I, I had had a chance, you know, not to get too far on a tangent, but I had a, a, no, a chance okay. to interview um, Rob Villanueva, who is Charlie Villanueva's brother. 
and he shared a story with me about how Charlie V was the first person to tweet in the middle of like halftime. He's like, oh, here's what's going on here. And the NBA in, imparted their social media policies. So because now to it. see Draymond literally, you know, doing what he's doing in game, uh, I'm sorry, pregame, right after the game, so to speak, it's like, it's really wild to see how that pendulum has swung to, again, we just want more content from these players. And Draymond is a great content producer. Yeah, I mean, the Warriors fan base is certainly divided on it. Like, uh, some people don't love him doing it. And there's this idea that, like, somehow he's not focused and giving his all to the team, right, and their run because of it. And I don't love that. Um, you know, it's, like, optically, I understand why people are not upset, but I'm like, guys like do you really think when they're not playing that they spend every minute of their day like they right like this is time he could be eating this is time he could be watching tv like how long do you think like recording a podcast is taking and plus he's with like the like volume which is not like you know he probably just like records uploads and they like he probably does very little work but except for like giving his analysis but the the fan base is uh, you know divided on it but that said He's been talking a lot. So like even in his post game, he just makes comments and they kind of rub people the wrong way. And then on top of that, add to that what he was doing um, last night in the game. And so at first, me as a Warriors fan, I was annoyed by him. I like he it like, look, with Dre, like you take the good with the bad. Right. So I think on some level, even if it's a little different, you guys probably feel a little similar with Marcus Smart, right? But um, with Dre, I was really annoyed last night because like you were at risk, right? Like they legit could have called a double tech, you know, and you could have got gotten ejected from the game. And it's just like, I just don't understand like why you push the boundaries when it's like that, because there might be a ref who's a dick and like, whatever, I am going to eject you, you know, like you never know. And so why even do it? Like why even put the team at risk? Right. So I was annoyed, but then when I saw the post game comments from, you know, Jalen and I, like, you know, NBA Twitter today, especially Celtic Twitter, I'm seeing like everyone kind of complaining about Draymond. I'm like, you know what? Draymond did his job because like, he got into their heads, you know? And I was just like, and that's, that's like in itself, like a savviness that like, you know, that's experience, like being a vet and also like having played in NBA finals. I'm just like, this is wild to me that Celtics fans are complaining about this. When you guys had a guy like Kevin Garnett on your team, like, what do you think he used to do out there? You know, like, oh. this is like, you well, know, the, the same kind of thing. So um, I was pretty surprised by like how they reacted to it um and so now I'm a little less annoyed with him so that was my thoughts on it go ahead Derek I wouldn't compare that to Kevin Garnett I would I, I watch wouldn't. the Celtics all the time and no, Kevin no, no, Garnett's I, one I'm, of my favorite players no I don't put like to, I'm, I'm gonna say like this because I think there's a difference between being physical and actually like and getting some and playing mind games versus doing what he did last night he was basically practicing football out there like tackling and all that stuff that's not that's not i can pull up some crazy things kevin garnett did on the court that, like what are we doing <laughs> look that's a different era though we that's also have karate kick um from marcus smart like the that image he, of him karate kicking that he play. was called that was called a foul was it not but that, you was, guys was that not moves was that not called a foul i'm not what i saw draymond do last night should have dude should have been ejected early like Okay. That was ridiculous. That's I'm, ridiculous. I'm really not trying to hear that. In the first quarter. That's fine. But in that's, the first quarter of game one, no Celtics starter was called for a foul. Do you think you guys really played an entire quarter without fouling any of our guys? Do you think that really Hold happened? On. I'm not saying, I'm, listen, I'm not saying that any game is called perfectly, okay? Right. Game, so I'm just saying one, you guys got a lot game of missed one, calls. But game one was called closer to the middle than last night was. It was game two. The fouls are pretty even in this. In you this thought series. that was. If you look, there were, at... there were two. There were two fouls that were called on Grant, where Grant wasn't even fouling. Draymond Listen. literally goes to spear him, and that was called a foul on Grant. There's that's a not. Clip. That's not a basketball move, nor is it even. There's a clip going around of Grant foul. when he tried to push Wiggins over. 
and Wiggins just basically shoved him. And then oh, he, when he tried hand. to elbow him into the back of the head or the neck. All I'm saying that was is close to elbow. My, yeah, come my on now. Point, I really <laughs> and I and Pool did the same thing too, where he was care he's about fouls. Too. Like my whole point is like I'm not trying to make this about fouls, and I just mm-hmm. think Celtics fans are lacking some self awareness, in my opinion, to sit up here and be critical of fouls when like you guys foul a lot. Jalen travels up and down the fucking court. There's so much stuff that is not called on your team that you guys get away with. A lot of times, good defense that's, that are fouls that are not being called. And so, like, this thing about Dre, like, I'm not saying that, like, if I was an opposing team that, like, Dre wouldn't annoy me. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is you guys got away with calls. That's how series go. One game, one team kind of gets more. Another team, another game gets more. So people, when you're like, well, that was called on Marcus Smart, but there's a lot of shit that isn't called on Marcus Smart. There's a lot of shit that isn't called that they do do when they foul that doesn't get called. So the fact that it wasn't called no, on I Trey agree. doesn't no, I matter. Saying, I agree that there are missed calls. I'm not saying that we... The that, fouls that are the even Celtics... in this series in terms of the numbers. You get that, right? Like, if you yes, look at the one two games... What I'm, but what I'm saying is what was allowed to get away with last night is not what happened game one. <laughs> those I are two drastically, got away with two drastically different one. things. That's a, those are two different that's drastically different things. Right, but the, do you see how you're saying you thought Dre got away or away with no, a lot? No, listen, I, not just I Draymond. Thought the Celtics I thought did Poole too got away with a lot one. of stuff too. Okay, so then what's the difference? Y'all got away uh, with a lot in game listen, one. Listen, we got away with it in game two. I'm not, but I'm, what I'm saying is, I thought game one, both sides, because no. there's a lot of calls that I that I no. disagreed with for the Celtics. Okay. okay. Well, so I'm I'm not even I'm not even being a homer. I'm just saying. A little bit you are. You can feel that if you want. I'm just saying, game one, I thought that th- that the Celtics got fouls and the, and the Warriors got fouls. It was more the so whole evenly split. First Hold quarter. On. It was more so evenly split in terms of calls versus game two. That's all I'm saying. It was game evenly two, split. Can I say one two, two, though? It was not evenly split. No. Just real quick. I, By the I, number, it was. It's it's really interesting. I think when this conversation comes up because it. And this is no disrespect, I think, to anyone really, but Zach Harper, I know he, I, I, again, I just happen to listen to a lot of basketball stuff like that. He says this all the time. He's like, there's no rule that says the referees have to call fouls evenly. That is really a fan's thing. <laughs> you know, it really is like, sure. look sure. at it and it's like, okay, well, this team had more fouls. They had more free throws, whatever, whatever. There is no rule. And I, and I feel like, you, I think you're both right. Like sometimes it goes one way or another. My perspective from the Draymond situation last night was that it kind of went beyond just getting fouls calls and because he was playing a mind game. So those mind games ended up being kind of like non-basketball related. And that's what made it look in a lot of ways egregious, especially if you're looking from the Celtics standpoint. So now I even give you some credit because you're like, yeah, you know, looking at it like you were even annoyed, but then you realize what it did. And right. That's, that's what I'm sure. saying. And I'm not yeah. saying that it wasn't a mind game thing. I agree. That's what, that's what he was doing. But what I'm saying is what uh, the, the, the level, the extremity in that level of where well, you're not calling these when you would normally call these different calls during a regular season or even a playoff game. That's not what was called last but night. That's that what wasn't, always that happens was, in the postseason. Things I, get called I differently. That. I know that it gets called differently. But what I'm saying is that this is not that wasn't even a basketball move. No. That wasn't that. First off, those, that should have been a double tech. So what? With him and Tate, with him and Jalen. That's and what they, happens call, when you're Draymond call, Green. He's built that, but so like that's the, not going to happen. That on, makes on, him smart. That's not something to be critical of. On, but on on the broadcast, everyone is saying that this is that because he already has a tech, this should not. They're not going to call and it. And Jabby like said, that, "I wouldn't call it. I would let it go." So because he already former. had a tech previous to that, right? So <laughs> that that doesn't even make sense. You're selectively calling. They selectively call all the time for players. That's not like unique to I'm aw- Draymond. I'm aware of that, but what I'm saying is that specifically to admit that on broadcast is is very interesting. But That's all. I, I guess it doesn't matter to me if they admit it, if we know that they do that, right? They selectively call things for stars like all the time. Um, you know, so like to me, I, I think my annoyance with it all, because I really don't want to have a discussion about fouls, is that like, the Warriors, from their perspective, and at least from our fan base, we thought the game was pretty unevenly called the first game. 
I don't care about what fans complain about because we're fans, but like the Warriors did not go into the post game talking about officiating. That's the thing that annoys me. They were like, they didn't feel us. We need to match their intensity. That's it. Like they, they didn't make it about officiating. Jalen Brown went into the game and said some phantom fucking call took him out of the game. Negro, that call was like way in the beginning of the game. That took you out so early in the game, you couldn't perform for the whole second half. That's corny to me. That's weak. Like, I don't want to hear about officiating. So that that was my take on it. Like, don't complain about officiating. Go out and fix it because you guys got away with some stuff in game one too. Um, and so I just, I didn't want to hear about it. And when I hear players go into a game talking about officiating, I know that the other side got into your head. And that was really the only point that I'm making. Like that you're going to have games that don't go your way, especially when you're the home team, you're going to get home cooking. Like I expect when, when the Warriors travel to Boston, there's going to be home cooking. And like, that's just the way it goes. And they expect that because they've been in the finals and they've been through this. So, you know, welcome to the big stage, this, 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 this group of the Celtics. I know the, the Celtics have a long legacy of championships, but not this group. So welcome. And now you're learning. Hello. Sure. No, I agree with that. And and I'm not saying that the that uh, Jalen should not have been have allowed that to affect his game overall. But when you do have calls that affect how you how you're able to to defend, that's that that is what it is. That's what we happened have, to us in game fouls. one. Three fouls, I'm just, I'm two just fouls saying. on on Wiggins, two fouls on Steph. They couldn't get aggressive. Our starters got all the foul calls and the Celtics starters got none. And that's the point. This game, it was the Celtics starters got a lot of foul calls and we didn't. And that allowed us to be more aggressive. So that's why I'm saying it's pretty even. You disagree still? No, I, I look, I get, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. But all, all, the only thing that I'm saying is to me, officiating across the board, this is not just this game that I'm talking about. It's been across the board, and and honestly, throughout the playoffs, regular season, officiating should be addressed in a in a in a different way. Because I actually think that the the way that referees have been calling these games a lot, I I do I honestly believe that if you're going to uh, punish players for certain things, referees should should get punishment as well, I, or fined, whatever that is. Because to me, that now you're messing up the the game. So there there have been games matchups in in the playoffs to me that I actually thought could have been more of a classic matchup had referees not gotten involved like in the buck series buck series uh, like any 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 a lot of series actually uh west and east I thought there was a lot of calls that referees got into it and kind of messed it up to, from being a classic as a basketball fan I want to see the, the the players play I don't want to see the game be in the hands of the referees okay. that's my that's my that's my that's my point that's, that's my fair. point. were you annoyed in the buck series i'm just curious i know we're going backwards but i'm curious warren were you annoyed by the way that series was officiated because i know there was a lot of talk around like Giannis, but he just gets those calls i personally don't enjoy watching it myself but um i'm curious like did you feel strongly about it either way when you guys played the the bucks no, I mean, I think I'm just, like you said, in some ways, kind of just too grizzled <laughs> to know how these things are going to go and certain players are going to get away with certain things and the physicality. It, I think what Derek is saying, though, doesn't, doesn't make a lot of sense that there needs to be a certain level of consistency that's throughout. It doesn't really make sense logically that, hey, it's called this way for 82 games and then, oh, the calendar turns to April 18th and now we call things this way. And referees right. do have the referees meeting and they'll be like, okay, well, how are we going to officiate this one here tonight? Do we want to let them be physical or no, are we going to be ticky tack? And that, that level of consistency is frustrating, especially from the fans viewpoint, because then it's like, yeah, you don't know what you're going to get game to game. Or right. you, like you said, Hey, we're going into Boston. We expect to get jobbed here tonight or whatever the heat fans and the heat series. Oh, I live in the South Florida area. My God. They, the same thing. They were just like, my Boston is getting everything. There's no fouls on them, so forth and so forth. And I was like, again, I can see why you'd feel that way. And referees, they're still human. They, they miss calls back and forth. I mean, I, again, I think 
there's some things I remember even in this game too. I'm just like, wow, that, that was interesting. I think the most egregious thing to me, and it didn't really change the outcome of the game, I think was a, a foul on Jalen Brown on, on Gary Payton's drive. <laughs> he was just, he, right. he went by and they showed the re- and he'd like, right. again, there was, he touched him like because his jersey touched him and they called the foul. But like you said, that shit happens, yo. And it's, again, yeah. it, it, that shouldn't have dictated how the game was going to determine for, for the Celtics. They got rocked out in the third quarter. And that's yeah. because they kept throwing the ball to the opposite team on a regular basis. And, and they I, were searching for calls too. That much to yeah, do points it. off turnovers. Yeah. You guys won that battle in the first game, right? Because mm-hmm. the actual turnovers were pretty close. I think the in game one, the Warriors had 14 turnovers Celtics had 12 but you guys had way more like points that you scored off the Warriors turnovers right a lot of um live ball turnovers and so in this game the Warriors I looked it up and now I can't remember it was either 15 or 21 like I don't know why those two numbers are in my head but the Warriors scored more points this time so game one you guys got the one that battle um game two the Warriors won that battle the rebounding battle has been pretty much the same I think the first game the teams had the same number of rebounds second game um I think you guys had one more rebounding so like while in the past series the Warriors have actually been out rebounding every team this series people were like oh y'all not gonna do that and while they're not out rebounding the Celtics they're also not getting out rebounded it's been relatively even so Mm -hmm. all this talk about the Warriors and their size and they've been able to still you know, play with, with teams who have a lot more length on them. So I think it's been pretty good, you know, so far through the first two games. Um, I am curious to see what adjustments um, Yudoka is going to make. And I'd, I'd like to hear from you guys what you think he's going to do because he's not someone who likes to be punked. Like, I don't know if y'all saw that part when he like took off his mask. It, I thought he said like, you're a pussy. That's what I, that's what I saw. <laughs> I I love him (laughs) and I was like yo this is great so what are you expecting from him in terms of adjustments I mean I have some thoughts on what I think they're going to do but I would like to know from your perspective what you guys think is going to happen go ahead D okay um I I was actually thinking probably halfway through the game last night I would be intrigued to see if he decides to switch white and smart at starting or start both of them and have uh, Jalen maybe come off the bench or sit Rob, have Horford at the five, uh, uh, Tatum at the four, Jalen at the three, and smart at the two with white at the one. I wouldn't mind seeing some, some symbols of that because I personally, I don't even know if, I consider Robert to be making that big of an impact to start right now. So I wouldn't even be mad to see him just come off the bench and then you just start white with smart and, and, and just keep that lineup Um, because white has been uh, pushing the pace a little bit better um, in the first two games. I think Uh, it, it's weird, but I don't even think it's more so of, of a Marcus smart thing initiating the offense i just think that white just does something a little differently on offense than than smart does and you just have him play defense while you have white play offense i'm not i wouldn't be mad at seeing that i was gonna no, ask about rob oh i'm sorry i warned no 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 no, no. go ahead go ahead, go ahead i was sure. gonna say i was gonna ask about rob because i mean he he was effective i thought yeah. in the first game and in general i mean you guys have been you guys the Celtics have, I keep saying that, and I don't know, because some people don't like when I do that. I know Derek doesn't mind, but I don't you know. You can Warren say you guys, I'm fine with that. I don't know how Warren, how you feel about it. <laughs> but, um, like, he was definitely effective at, like, like altering shots at the rim or just, like, you know, preventing them. In general, like, the whole team, like, you guys had a lot of blocks. Um, This time, the Warriors still didn't get to the rim as much as I would have liked, but they had, like, a lot of bunnies they just missed, right? So this time, they were getting more, and, like, even though they weren't converting, they were getting there. So they 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 definitely had more presence at the rim than they did in the first game. But Rob looked to be less spry in the second game than he did the first game. And I know in the last series, he, like, he missed some games here and there. So, like, do you expect it's going to be the same in this series? I mean, there is more time in between games. Unlike um, the only time they have one night off is when the series goes to Boston for games three and four. But outside of that, they have two games off, you know, like two days off in between games. So I'm just curious 
um, your thoughts on that. But, and also Warren, I want to hear whatever it was you were going to say in response to Derek. No, for sure. I, I think with, with, with Rob, it's, it is apparent, right? He's, he's playing through something that he probably shouldn't be playing. If it wasn't the NBA finals, he wouldn't be out there. So a lot of credit is being given to him for that as well, too. He obviously he just signed his new deal, et cetera, a very friendly deal, mind you, for what he's bringing. Um, but he's not right. And, and I think what Derek said does make some sense in terms of, you know, maybe starting Horford at the five and allowing White and Smart to play together in the backcourt and Tatum that kind of a small ball four. Um, that might make some sense for them. They traditionally have not gone that route, but they'll just switch Rob Williams with Grant Williams um, and allow that to be the case. Um, I don't think this is really a tight series where Ty should be playing a whole lot of minutes. I don't I don't like that matchup, you know, for them, although he's played he's played well in the spot minutes that he's had. Um, but 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 Rob is really, really struggling out there. And you can only hope for him that these two days off in between games will will be able to get him right. But um, if he can't be out there, yeah, I think he's playing like, you know, 15 to 19 minutes right now. Um, he's used to in like the 25 to 27 range. And just again, he changes she changes things defensively for the Celtics. One of the things that I think Yudoka will probably implore is while the Celtics do like to switch everything defensively, um, they may need to be selective because what ended up happening in the second half was Curry wasn't just getting one screen. He was getting multiple screens and then hunting again so that he'd be able to get a big who potentially sag or, or find a favorable matchup. And again, maybe I don't know enough about NBA coaching or schematics, so to speak, but I think you can kind of be like, all right, it's me and Derek. Derek, we won't switch. <laughs> you know what I mean? If they run two screens, yeah. I'm not switching it this time. Yeah. And that would, even if, even if you switch those looks up, even for Curry, that was like, okay, are they switching this time? Or are they not switching this time? And that doesn't allow him to kind of get comfortable knowing that Boston is going to switch every single screen. Right. And I think those are things that could maybe throw, I mean, the Curry, I mean, he's seen every defense out there. So I'm not saying like you can't stop Steph, but I mean, you do have to give him different looks. And I think that's something that maybe the Celtics might implore, um, especially if, if Time Lord is not David out there to utilize his length. And if he gets switched onto things, you know, and drop coverage, and we don't want to see that. Yeah, because they were still dropping on Steph. And um, I... I think they're definitely going to switch up their coverages on Steph, but you know, the pick and roll was giving them problems last night and it, they ran a lot of pick and roll in game two, <laughs> a lot of pick and roll. Um, so, but the thing about it is it's one of the reasons why Kerr doesn't run pick and roll so much like during the regular season, because we rarely run it. We're like one of the lowest pick and roll teams. Like it's, during the it's primary is primarily dribble handoffs. And, you know, and, and yeah, split right. action. Um, and he does that intentionally. So like teams don't like know how to like really defend it or can't like get used to it or get comfortable with it. And there's like not a lot of footage out there on it. So, but I mean, I just, I know they're going to switch up their coverages on stuff. So like, I'm expecting it at least once just to kind of see, you know, what it's going to look like. And so, but usually when a teams do that, right then that's usually when like his teammates can take advantage of like whatever they're going to throw. So, you know, I, I would expect a game like that to sort of look like what game one looked like for the Celtics. Um, but we'll see, you know, I'm not sure. So that, that was my expectation that they're going to kind of change some of those coverages for, for, for Steph, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think they will, but my one of one of the things for me is just making sure that they figure out um what they need to do and stay in like how they play because the turnovers we've seen this throughout the playoffs especially when you have a lot of turnovers you're likely not winning the game so i actually thought that they were still i know a lot of people were, were freaking out by the third quarter I actually wasn't because to me is when, when you're, when you're still playing how you play, when you play your defense, the way you play your defense and you, you move the ball offensively, you move it the way you usually move it. They're able to get those stops and, and, and get back into the game. So I actually wasn't expecting them to, uh, I wasn't expecting for uh, Udoka to, um, to wave the white flag as early as he did, but I understand why he did it because there was no way they were going to be able to get back into that game uh, last night at all. Like, 
I'd say by by the, by the beginning of the fourth quarter, that was pretty much going to be it. Um, so I, and guys I were hurt too. And yeah, guys yeah, hurt. I think it's just yeah. that too. You know, you know, you know, Rob's yeah. hurt. You know, Tatum's still doing whatever was going on with that shoulder. Smart still nursing the ankle. So yeah. it's like, listen, hey, he kind of conceded. You know, yeah. to your point as well too. It's like, hey, we got one. That wasn't the intent. You know what I mean? It was yeah. like, hey, we get one to be settled. But once you got rocked out in the third, it was like, all right, <laughs> yeah. you know, maybe yeah. we don't have it tonight, and uh, we'll yeah. go ahead right. and end up the fight another day. And I'm fine with that. I I just think that is with if they and they have not lost back to backs, but if they play the way they played last night in terms of being careless with the ball, there's no way they can win a game. That that's just that's just not how how they win a game. So if they if they keep keep that ball moving the way it needs to move and they just stay the course and don't let any anything stupid get in their heads i don't have i'm not i'm not i'm not expecting them to lose a game i'll put it like that so both of these teams turn over the ball a lot the warriors more mm-hmm. so than the Celtics, but they both turn the, the ball over right the warriors where the turnovers really hurt them are, are live ball turnovers um mm-hmm. but they um they were good with last night they weren't they weren't turning over the ball a lot and when they did like I said the Celtics just they they weren't scoring off of those turnovers so um I don't really expect the turnovers to change because both of these teams have shown us like that that's what they do right so I just sort of feel like it's something to watch in the series like who's going to benefit more from you know each team turning the ball over. I am curious to know, um, Warren, um, both of you actually, but I'm going to go to Warren first this time. What do you think about, because like coming into this matchup, it was framed as um, the best offense versus the best defense. And and really a lot of that is about what's been happening in the playoffs because people seem to forget that the Warriors <laughs> were like one of the best defenses also in the yeah. regular season. So like, but they just, people don't talk about the Warriors defense. They act like they're just an offensive team. Their offense actually during the regular season was not good because Clay missed 40 plus games, Steph missed games, right? So their offense was actually middling, but in the postseason, the Warriors have had the number one offense. So why do you think that people only talk about like the Celtics being a defensive team, but don't talk about the Warriors also being a defensive team, which they've always been for every postseason run that they've ever had? yeah it's selective memory you know really at this point and i think it's just because it's it's shiny and you have to pit something against something else per se so let's not talk about that the words actually play defense too <laughs> let's just focus on you know that offensive side of it and because it is you know pardon the pun but it is splashy it is it's going to catch the headlines and all on all of those things you know just because of that and then you know the rugged celtics if you will i say this all the time the boston celtics have length right they're a big team I I don't get the sense that they're this imposing physical force. I don't get that sense. Hence why they're able to be in an even rebounding battle versus a smaller team. Um, They didn't kill Miami on the glass and Miami's a smaller team as well too. But what they do do is that they, in essence, do play smart defense. They do close out well. They'll get their hand up. And they, you know, again, they do those things that are smart. And again, the switchability allows them to not really have too many mismatches, except for like Peyton Pritchard or something like that. Right. But they're not overly physical. And I think that is a misconception about Boston's defense because it has been so good. Um, I think there are more physical teams out there. And honestly, I think Golden State's a more physical team. I thought Miami was more physical. I know Milwaukee was more physical. So at the end of the day, Boston's been able to get by two out of those three teams thus far. Um, We'll see where the rest of this goes. But it is a really interesting conversation that Golden State's defense isn't talked about, especially with what they did you know, in previous series, walling guys off and things that nature and Luca had some fits, you know what I mean? And, and, and again, they make others beat them. And I think that's why you saw what you saw in game one. Kerr was like, go ahead, Reggie Bullock. <laughs> you know what I mean? Maxi Kleber, do your, do your best. Yeah. And I think he would try and do the same thing in game one, but they switched things around here in game two. And, you know, I think Golden State's defense is not one to be played with. Yeah. I mean, um, it's, it's interesting to me because I'm just like, Y'all know that Draymond Green's on the team. Like, I get, because, like, Cedric Maxwell made, like, this comment, like, oh, those guys were tuxedos. Like, I get it. We have the light-skinned pretty dudes. But, like, 
stop. Like, I don't understand. Like, this is a fucking defensive team. Like, what are we doing? Like, in all of their previous runs, not only were they like a defensive team, but they were usually top five, like one or two, you know, like a top, top defense. And before Draymond Green went down this year, our our defense was like historically a great defense, like not even just like on some oh, they're a really good defense, top defense. So it was just crazy to me kind of the way people talked about it or the way people think that they're just going to like impose their physical will. Like I, I thought like when I think of the way the the, the Celtics defend, um, because I actually thought that like the the hardest in terms of defense, I feel like the Warriors were dealing with were um, the Grizzlies. Not because I don't think the, the Celtics defense is legit, because I do. I said like, man, their defense is so legit. I've been talking about it, but it's because the Grizzlies, they, um, they play like the passing lanes and a lot. And so like the Warriors, that's how they have like a lot of turnovers because like their movement. Right. And like, they just like knew those, those reads and they were, they're tall and they're athletic. And so, you know, they, they just forced a lot of shit. Like they had JJJ at the rim, like really deterring, um, Staff and and more so pool like from going to the rim so it, it's different where like what you said like with the Celtics it's a lot of switching and they just kind of like even though they're switching they kind of like they stay in front of their man exactly you know that, like I think, they, they, it's a different style of defense yeah. you, you and, hit the nail on the head with the Memphis thing because exactly like Memphis is going to take more gambles Boston's defense is very like we're trusting our principles we're going to be here we're going to keep you in front of us where a team like Memphis is a little bit more physical too, but they're going to gamble and and sit and jump out at passes. And that can be, you know, to Golden State's detriment because they will, again, turn it over. We're going over Boston's like, well, we're keeping in front of you. Switch. All right. Stay attached. And it's it's a different type of thing. I think that's an excellent observation. And so, yeah, I can't take all the credit for that because it might, um, Golden Space's co-host Justin pointed out to me. And then when I went back to look at games, I was like, you know, like this is like spot on. And you know, then I started like paying more attention and it was like, cause you know, like the Celtics really play defense on a string, you know? Um, but it's very different than the way that the, the, the Grizzlies play defense. So, um, but both look, both great defensive teams, the Celtics, I, I think the defense is elite. I just kind of thought it was interesting the way people thought it was going to give us so much problems. Cause I felt like it was somewhat of like a lazy analysis, you know, like it's going to give us problems, but not like all of the like typical like oh golden golden state doesn't like for people to touch them and and oh they like it was just like come on like what what are we doing so i thought that was a little silly um do you have any thoughts on that derek um i mean they they play different different t- styles uh, like that's that's just the i don't think that it means that uh that in terms of golden state's defense and 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 boston's defense they are two of the top defenses in the league, and yeah, it wasn't it wasn't um, it wasn't broadcasted that way. But again, like Warren said, it's it's a it's a narrative thing. You have to have a narrative going into these different series. So that's what the narrative was for this series. I, I to it me, was. I honestly didn't care. <laughs> I would have just been interested to hear because, like, when people kept saying, "Like, what are we? What are the Warriors going to do? Like, when the Celtics defend like this?" I would have loved to hear the other side of what are the Celtics going to do, right? Like, with the Warriors' defense, and I really mm. didn't hear that. And so, like, we saw a little bit of it last night, and like, the, and then in general too, there's like, there's always like a discussion around how, because like. I didn't think it was really a fair assessment. Like after game one, people kept saying like, oh, this is an outlier performance from the Celtics. They're not going to shoot like that again. And while I don't think you guys are going to shoot like that every game, I definitely think you guys will shoot like that again. (laughs) Um, Probably in one, maybe two other games because you've done it in every series, right? You guys are like a streaky shooting team. So like when you get hot, you just get like really fucking hot. And then, but then on the other end, the lows are really lows and like the offense can just really, really, really get stagnant. So I'm curious, like, how do you, do you need to like overcome or co- like combat that in this series or like w- what are you going to do to like yeah combat against that because I just feel like I've seen it every series now so I don't think it's going to change right and so I think that will happen again just like I think the hot night will happen again 
you talking about overcome the highs and lows of, of the yeah because I think that unlike other teams that you guys have played none of the offenses have been as good as Golden State right so mm-hmm. like and you get like that really really like stagnant sort of state of offense and then also like you now you have two teams that can both play defense like mm-hmm. what what are you gonna do and like I don't know, like, if you're going to have too many of the games where the offense is stagnant or if you're going to have, like, more of the games where, like, you guys just, like, go off. And when it comes to, like, the home court advantage at TD Garden, it it hasn't been, like, an extreme home court advantage, right? So, like, I'm not confident saying, like, the Warriors could go in there and, and not win a game, but the Warriors, not just this postseason, but in general, like, over the course of their playoff careers they always win a game like in the opposing team's arena always like going back for years now Mm -hmm. and the Celtics just in this this edition of the Celtics this um just this year like teams have come in there and been able to win except for the 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 Nets so I'm just curious if the if the stag if the offense goes stagnant like that like it can Right. I don't think it's going to be like a thing like, oh, they have home court. So it's going to like I don't think for you guys that it matters. Like, I don't think that the home court necessarily is giving you guys some advantage. That's really my point. So what are you going to do? Like if you like if there's more times than not in this series that the offense goes stagnant, like what are you going to do? Because Golden State can be a potent offense. And if they're not if their shots aren't falling, they can also be a defensive team like the Celtics. And I do think that's different than the Bucks, where like you just had Giannis, but like Middleton, not, Middleton wasn't there. So you were expecting Drew to be like this efficient score. Like he's like, that's not Drew. He's not a shot creator. He can't create the kind of offense the way Golden State can. And like with the Nets, they just don't play defense. You know, so like, even though those guys can score, they don't play defense. The Warriors do. So to me, it's a combination the Celtics haven't seen yet this postseason. So if if the, the way to combat that, if you can, obviously, is, is obviously trying to get to the line. Um, and I think one of the biggest things we already touched on with Rob not being healthy, that takes away that lob threat. You know, that back line, having him as kind of like that back line outlet, if you will, was was immense for them in the regular season and able to get them those easy back baskets especially if golden state's rushing up front sending two and three guys or whatever on drives or whatever that leaves rob open but if he's not there that just makes it so much tougher to get those points um golden state won the points in the battle points in the paint battle last night i think 40 to 24 or something like that as well you know and again you think golden state oh it's a jump shooting team they shoot it well 40 of their points came in the paint out of their 107 so i think that's where boston has to try to figure out a way to fabricate that and as we said they don't have a, just a legitimate post-up threat and again golden state's defense will be able to sit down on them so i think you're going to look for them to try to create and fabricate some fouls to get to the free throw line because they're not going to be able to just waltz into the lane and blow by their guy without seeing a second and third defender unfortunately so i, I hate to say that as jump shots or die um but it is looking like a little bit tougher for them to fabricate that offense and i'm keep looking at the stats and i'm just like celtics hit 15 threes last night and still only had 88 points. <laughs> just like, that's like, that's, you know, bizarre to me. You know what I mean? And again, like I said, so all those points from the outside, you know what I mean? And obviously the 18 turnovers as well. So they got to figure out ways to do something outside of the three-point line uh, against Golden State. And it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. You know why that happened too? is because um, you had guys, Tatum, for example, uh, going inside the paint was searching for, the foul call more so than than just going up and scoring he's done that that's that's my that's one of my biggest gripes about him honestly is that he will search for the for the call instead of just go go for the score and a lot of guys do that in this in this uh day and age honestly but he does it he, he does it way too much in my opinion and i think that that's started to be something that a, a lot of people last night a lot of guys were starting to do uh was search for the calls instead of just just go up for the basket. <laughs> so I think that's why the 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 shot the shot selection was like that with like the way it was last night because 
he's got to go quicker though. I mean, I think there's times where he's waiting for Golden State's defense to come and and to set, even when he yeah, does yeah, have yeah. a mismatch. Yeah. And I, I think you say that all the time with like, you know, especially with wing guys who have some size. If if you get it on the block, the mid post or whatever, go quick. Don't wait for the defense to come at you. Yeah. I I know everyone's, you know, don't shoot mid range, whatever, whatever. But I'd rather you do a quick turnaround with Jordan Poole on you as opposed to trying to back him down, dribble, dribble, dribble. And now Draymond comes over. Now Otto Porter comes over. And now what the F are you going to do? Like that doesn't yeah. make sense to me. So that, yeah. that to me, just make a quick decision instead of trying to hunt for fouls, so to speak. I'd, I'd much rather live with that um, as opposed to going against set defense, especially when two or three guys are coming at you. No, I agree with that. Agree Did with you that. feel um, GP2's impact on the game last night? Not not in the way that I guess I think everybody else is saying, but I mean, yeah. it, I, I guess I would pose it to you even that. Uh, so if, if Iguodala is back, do they split those minutes or does, does Kerr just go, Hey, I'm going to go with my, my season grizzled guy and, and let, give Iggy all the, all the minutes. Sorry, Iguodala. I know something to be called Iggy. Iguodala all the minutes as opposed to getting. Thank G. you for saying that because even Warriors fans will call him <laughs> Iggy. And I'm like, the man says, do not call him that. Call him it. Andre. Like I never <laughs> call him Iggy. Um, you know, I, like I didn't love Iggy. Iggy. Now I'm calling him that. I didn't love Andre. I never call him that. You just made me say, <laughs> I didn't love Andre's minutes in the first in the first game. Um, I'm not surprised that Kerr played him, but I think that GP2 held up. So I expect um, and it, like this wasn't just this neck thing with Andre. They said his knee was like swollen. So I don't know. My guess is that GP2 is going to see more of the minutes and I think he should see more of the minutes. Right. And so um, because ironically enough, and like, I mean, we still don't know with that arm, but he's actually one of our best vertical threats, which is crazy yes. because he's so little, but he is. And so um, he just creates like some other looks for us. So I don't know, but I, I mean, I was just happy to see him back on the court, but I, I think that he can be a factor. Look, I think the biggest factor in this series outside of Steph, honestly, is Andrew Wiggins. He's been our second most consistent player. Like, look, I think Dre was important last night, but like, you're just getting some really solid defense from Andrew Wiggins and, you know, he, the, the offensive rebounds, just like this, he's just like in attack mode and it's been really good for us. So, you know, I'm going to go ahead and give my picks because we're about to wrap, but I had the Warriors winning this in six um you know i'm curious to know what, what what you guys picked for this series and if anything has changed now that they've they've gone two games well i i be honest like i said i'm not i'm not a homer in any sense of the word i'm, I'm really not and i think if from celtics nation if you will i get a lot of slack for that you know just pick team green i wrote what i wrote i one time wrote for celtics life and had to um, do their playoff picks, and I and it when at the Heat were at their height of their superpowers, and I picked Miami to beat, and I just it was I am slayed, <laughs> just slayed. I was like, well, I'm sorry, they're a better team, and you know Miami ended up winning, or the case may be. So I just don't I don't have green lenses on. So coming into the series, not even aside from experience, I think I was just worried about the overall offensive capability of Golden State coupled with you know their elite defense. And I actually picked Golden State in six to win the series. Um, it is changing. I'm still picking the Warriors, unfortunately. I do think it will go seven, though. Um, I do see a little bit more from Boston than that that I didn't know was going to be there, especially with them winning game one um, and, and if finding a way to power through. It wasn't it wasn't cute for a, for a good part of it and the way they responded in the fourth quarter. And they believe in themselves in a lot of ways. And they know if they clean up the turnovers, they can make this series a lot closer you know, than I think that a lot of people were maybe giving them credit initially for. But um, ultimately... The Warriors are just kind of, I don't want to say experience. Um, they just they just kind of know what to do. And Curry, to me, is the, is the ultimate equalizer. Um, I'm deathly afraid anytime he shoots the basketball still to this day. <laughs> and the conversations, I don't know if you all saw it as well, too. And Derek, I'd love to hear your opinion on this. You know, where, okay, well, who's the best player in the series? And I was like, well, I understand, you know, who would you take going forward? You know, because there's a 10-year age gap, so to speak. But the single most devastating threat in the NBA Finals is Steph Curry. What are we doing? I, I, I love Jason Tatum. 
but he he doesn't instill fear in me <laughs> the way that Curry dribbling the basketball does. And to me, those are things that I think those intangibles, if you will, give the Golden State the advantage that I think probably ultimately gives them another championship. Yeah, no, I would say Steph is the is the best overall player in the in the series. Um, my um, my pick has not changed though. I'm still saying Boston is seven. And that's not because I'm a homer. That's just because I, I think in the long run, I think they're going to be able to get that. I think, and Nat, you might get upset me saying this. You've probably heard me say it before, but I think that um, I think that the the playoff run that Boston had uh, going against Milwaukee and Brooklyn and Miami, I think that actually set them up to be able to figure out how to play the series long and and make those adjustments you know this first year together and all that stuff so you, you this is kind of like learning on the fly in the playoffs anyway so i think that that kind of that set them up for this um and i do believe that golden state had a had an easier route to the playoffs um so i'm i'm going to take that experience of 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 that that going through those long series like that, I'm going to take that experience going into this uh, uh, and say that I think that although game two was atrocious, what I, even, even aside from, if I'm, aside from the officiating, the, the, the turnovers and stuff like that was atrocious from Boston. So I think they clean up their act and I think that they will push it to seven and I think they will win the seven. Okay. Um, Look at this, such a good, good um, conversation. I almost forgot, like gotta get you a word from Luke. We'll be right back. Hey guys, so I'm so excited to announce that I'm partnering with Loop. Loop offers hoop enthusiasts and sports fans like yourselves, another way to take your love for the game to the next level. They provide sports cards for card collectors and lovers of the game. Download the Loop app so you can be a part of one of the fastest growing sports communities. Use my personal link, loop.cards forward slash natfluential. Loop is spelled L-O-U-P-E and natfluential is spelled N-A-T-F-L-U-E-N-T-I-A-L. So use my personal link, like I said, loop.cards, plural, forward slash natfluential. And when you use that link to download the Loop app, you'll get $20 toward your first purchase in the Loop app. All right. So go ahead, go download it now. All these details that I included will be in the description for the show, wherever you listen to your podcast, or if you're watching on YouTube, it's also available in the description for the show. And there's a link there so you can click it, go click it, click the link now and get the $20 towards your first purchase. Don't say I never did anything for you. Happy purchasing. Okay, and we're back. So um, just to wrap up, I do have one final question for the, the three of you. Um, the three of you, the two of you, the three of us. Look at that. Listen, it's a late night, guys. Forgive me. Um, who do you think so far is winning the coaching battle? And um, like, if you follow me on on Twitter, you know that I'm pretty critical of Kerr. But um, he's been doing a pretty great job. So great might be pushing it. He's been doing a very good job. But um, like I thought his adjustments were excellent though yesterday. So yeah, I got to give him credit. Um, but I'm super impressed just with like, you know, Ime, like this whole postseason. So right now, do you think it's a tie? Do you think one is leading? And ultimately, who do you think comes out winning this coaching battle? <laughs> Um, I, I mean, I think it's, it'd be disingenuous to not say it's been even, you know, I think at, at this stage, even listen, I, I know there's the Golden State contingent that doesn't really love a lot of, you know, Bayelitsa and things of that nature too. But even when I saw him at the end of game one, I was like, wow, I wonder if he'll play some more now in game two. And he, oh, he, of course he is because <laughs> Kerr thought like, he's going to be like, oh, he did well, even though he had a negative plus minus, but he's going to be like, he did well. And like, he's going to put this fool on the court and it's going to drive me crazy. So yes, yeah. we're going to see him again. 
<laughs> so and and I was like, all right, well, that again, I thought that was a it was an interesting move. I was like, well, he has size, you know what I mean. So at least at the, the initial point of attack, maybe. And then you you figure Golden State's backline defense will help and things of that nature. But you know, Celtics hunted him out, so to speak. But ultimately, I think those second half adjustments and you know again, you know, death taxes and the Warriors in the third quarter. Um, that really was, I think, really, really special to see kind of in game two. But this is a very even series, and I don't think Udoka is going to get out coached. Um, I think he 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 beat the best coach in the NBA in Eric Spolstra <laughs> last series to me. I don't, I don't care what I anybody has Spo to say about that. So too. Spo is the best. Um, yeah. So to come out of that, come out of that series, you know, and beat the beat obviously Coach Bud as well too, defending coach and the being champion. If you, again, he's he Bud has the clown. We're not. I, I, I know, but him. I mean, you got to give him the, <laughs> Bud the clown. Championship. <laughs> So I'm not going to take that away from, from you. Don't do He's all. a clown. <laughs> but I, I think it's, I think it's going to be an even matchup throughout. I think it's, it's going to be the talent on the court that wins the series and not what, what somebody does or doesn't do on the sidelines in my personal opinion. Yeah. 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 I got it even too. I don't, I don't think I that either one is out coaching the other right now. I mean, we could probably have this conversation toward the end of the season, the series, but right now I think that it's even. Yeah, I'm quite, I'm quite impressed with the job that Kerr is doing by keeping up, you know, normally I'm coming in like all these coaches are better than him. <laughs> and um, I'm, I'm very impressed with what he's been doing. So again, everybody listening, this is Natalie giving credit to Steve Kerr, let it be wow. known, <laughs> you know, um, it's a little early for finals MVP talk. Um, I don't personally see like if the Warriors are to win, I think no one else but Steph is getting it. That's my, like, I just think the media, like after the whole 2015, like it's just not going to happen again. But I'm curious with the Celtics, if they were to pull it out, who do you guys think would be um, the finals MVP? Because there were some people who thought like Jalen should have gotten some votes for that new Western Conference Award last series. Um, and you know, like to me, in my opinion, I would still say that Tatum should be the leading person because at least like, for example, in game one, now I don't know that the, like, I don't think the Warriors are necessarily going to deploy their defense again, but like they were scheming for Tatum clearly. Right. And so to me, you have to take that into account. So even if he has like a poor shooting night, it's like, well, yeah, but the Warriors were scheming for him and he still had like all those assists. So I would still say that ultimately makes him more valuable, right? But obviously I kind of see that through a different lens because we have a player like Steph. So, um, but I, I saw like the NBA had like an MVP ladder and they had like Al Horford first. I was yeah. like, okay, this is ridiculous. Not because Al Horford isn't great. I'm actually an Al Horford stan, but it's like, for one, this is just one game. But do you guys just see the potential for any other player on the Celtics to potentially get the award? Because I think with your team, there's kind of always this Jason versus, um, yeah, the Jalen, I'm sorry, versus the yeah, Tatum debate. And, you know, Al Horford is having like this amazing series or postseason. I don't know that it'll continue because last night clearly wasn't good. But do you think there's a potential for anyone else to sneak away with the award if the Celtics win? Uh, um, if there's, go ahead. Well, go ahead, Derek. No, for sure. Go. Okay. Um, if there's anyone else outside of uh, Tatum, or or brown i'm gonna go ahead and say Derek white really mm -hmm. okay i'm gonna say Derek white because it, when you see the difference when he's on the on the court i mean you see the difference when, he, when tatum's on the court too but you see the difference when when white is out there and when he's not out there but do you think someone else should win or do you think it should be jason like i mean between the two games right now uh it's likely gonna be jason but if I'm going to go outside of Tatum, Brown, and Horford, it will likely either be White or Smart. I'll, I'll throw Smart in there too. That's one of those two. Yeah, I'd agree with Yashi. I, I, in, in terms of, I think Smart has the ability to impact the game statistically mm -hmm. across the board in a way that could maybe garner votes if Boston were to pull this out and Tatum were to continue to struggle from the field. So, so, so it would be nothing for Smart to have put up 15, 9, and 8 you know, throughout the rest of the series. And, you know what I mean? Almost average yeah. triple double and be like, oh, okay, well, you know, look, look what he did, especially with the way he can play defense as well too. And he's just really had 
um, a breakout year for him while he's he's while he does campaign for himself, you know, relentlessly. Um, he did, you know, obviously win, you know, the defensive player of the year and a number of a number of other accolades for him this year. And I think it would be really just like a true feather in his cap, if you will. He was able to get some of that done too. So yeah. it's it's clearly Tatum and Brown and you know in the in the pilot and co-pilot seat here. But if we're somebody to come back from the galley, it'd be Marcus Smart if Boston were able to pull it out. So you guys wouldn't be offended if like Brown were to win it. Mm-mm. I don't, I'm not offended because they win the championship. Like, <laughs> no, I, I, I agree. Like, it, it's everything is winning the championship. I think with Warriors, like, aside from the fact that Steph has just been so slighted so many times, but on top of it, it's also like, it's clear that it's Steph on the Warriors. It's not yeah. anyone else. I don't know that that's necessarily the case with the Celtics. I think there are genuine, you know, conversations about possibly. Jalen so I was just curious mm-hmm. because I don't always think the gap between them is as big as like people make it seem so that's what that's what I was like really curious about okay I keep saying that we're gonna wrap and then I think I promise final question um do you think the Celtics are still gonna because like I, you know there's this thing that people do with the Warriors in particular and I love it and I said this like when I saw Ime saying it but he's just like yeah you know we're gonna get physical with them and so it's just we're gonna get physical and there's this targeting of Steph thing that goes on Steph's defense Steph can play defense so I'm just okay. curious like all this targeting that people want to keep doing and thinking like you're just going to rough up the Warriors and I don't expect them to stop being physical but I mean do you expect it like do you think in their minds especially with like Cedric Maxwell making that whole tuxedo player comments like do you think that they're still walking into this in their minds like we can just rough them up and this is gonna like throw them off or like like do you think they're getting it now like okay we gotta like there's just more we have to do and maybe they always thought that but I just hear the comments all the time like they got physical with them they got you know like okay, great. You're going to get physical with us. And so fucking what? Like, <laughs> that's what the Cavs did. That's what the Raptors did. Like this team has seen everything. So what else are you going to do? And I'm just curious because this language gets thrown around a lot for the Warriors. Yeah, I don't think it's something that, you know, if Boston is smart and worth their salt, you know, they understand what this is. And there's there's a certain level of respect that you have to pay the Warriors, but there's not, you don't fear them, right? Of course. And, you know yeah. what I mean? And I think, you know, when it comes to stuff, yeah, he is still slight, if you will. Um, but I, I saw, like, I saw all the clips and even stuff like that too, especially what he's able to do out defending on the perimeter. And then even a little bit in the post as well. And I think, again, uh, when it comes to the post stuff, it really is about decision-making, just going quick you know, and not really trying to get too fancy with it. But he's doing a really good job of keeping in front of guys, I think, right now as well, too. So, you know, it's about trying to evolve in some different actions and giving him some different looks on that side of the basketball as well, too, and not allowing him to get comfortable. The key here is just not letting him rest. And I think that's what a lot of teams fail to do is that they like, all right, well, whatever, we'll hunt him, but then they don't do it consistently. <laughs> you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. they kind of let him kind of get his legs back. And then, you know, he can still kill you on the offensive side of basketball. But Boston's got to be smarter than that and not use cheap tricks and tactics that are you know ways of the of the old guard if you will to try to attack the Golden State Warriors yeah no I agree with that but I also think that it's important to uh to acknowledge that what you hear from fans or even like older players is not necessarily what the team (laughs) Feels. Oh, Ime said that. That's why I asked about it. But I'm okay. just saying, like others around, he was saying the physical thing too. Well, so. yeah. I mean, you got to play physical, but I, I don't, I don't think that there's a lack of respect for, because what I, if if I'm hearing you correctly, what what has been said about Steph and and the Warriors uh, is more so uh, like out of disrespect, and and not uh, uh, revering them. As, as I don't know. There's just this idea that they can't play defense and they can kind of just bully Steph. And I think that was something that I'm, you know, worked in, you know, years ago. It, it's just, it just seems to be the game plan that a lot of teams think like, you got to rough them up. You got to rough them up. But like Steph is a top 10 finals scorer. 
and playoff scorer. Like it doesn't stop the results. So, you know, when people say that, I just don't think it's like as, as effective as they think. So I just was curious. I think Emei's really smart and I don't have a problem with saying like, you got to get physical. I think the finals are going to be physical, but I'm just curious. Like, do you think that they're really like, oh, okay. Because I feel like there was a shock factor in like the physicality that the Warriors brought last night. And so do you think they're like, oh, okay. Like this is, this is what we're going to do. You know, like both but, teams. You know, I hope, I hope to a certain degree, not if you will like the, the celtics can't get away with being draymond and if they, again they take it to that to that lens they're going to play themselves out of the series but they have to be able to match a certain level of physicality and understand and then keep within the same mental state more than anything else but you can't go out there and do what draymond does like right. you absolutely cannot you will get clowned and get text and you'll be out of the series you know quick fast in a hurry so i think Ime has a pretty good sense of like what that needs to be um, and, and I hope we see that, you know, as a result throughout the rest of the first series. So we just have a good, clean and physical series where nothing where anything is dirty with the case may be. And like I said, I think I started to worry a little bit about, you know, Grant Williams last night and I saw Draymond say, you want to be me and all that stuff again. And like I said, it's just those, those mind games. Boston just has got to be above that. Um, and play their game, be physical, but not, you know, get, get psyched out. For sure. All right, you guys, thank you so much for a wonderful conversation. I know everyone is going to love this because I actually often think fans, and I mean, Warren, you're more than a fan. I mean, me and Derek are fans. We cover the game too, but I know you have like some different roles than we do. So, um, but I always feel like when you get people who actually cover the team or are fans of the team or talk about a team, I actually sometimes feel you get better conversations, like people that are watching than like when the national media is talking about our teams and mm -hmm. they just say like these generic statements where you're like, what, what are you guys watching? So thank you so much for such like a great insightful conversation. I think that, you know, um, my listeners, especially like Warriors fans, they're gonna learn a lot about the Celtics from this discussion. So thank you for being on. Warren, um, you are the best. Please, again, one more time, let people know where they can find you. Oh, I appreciate it, as always. Again, just happy to be here with y'all. Again, keep grinding, keep doing y'all thing. You can find me on Twitter at Shaw Sports NBA. Follow my great co-host, Game Face Lee. Follow the show at NBA Baseline. And for my non-basketball stuff, you can follow me at Dope underscore Interviews, where I'm doing conversations about people in the music, entertainment industry, you know, just kind of just having just everyday type of stuff, man. People doing dope stuff, hence why it's called Dope Interviews. So, so happy to be here with y'all, man. This was a great, great time, and I can't wait. And Derek, I need that splice of not giving all, <laughs> all the love to 19 Media Group. I got to put that I got up. you, bro. I got you. <laughs> Derek, my beloved producer. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. Thank you <laughs> for being on. Thank you for all that you do for me. Thank you for bringing all that forward. Thank you for OTS Media. Y'all, I know y'all are subscribed already, but if you're not subscribed, follow. And follow Derek and OTS Media on Twitter. Like y'all are doing your thing, what you need to do on, on YouTube and we appreciate it. But go give this man a follow on Twitter. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, yeah, you, if you want to follow me, uh, personal is at Derek underscore OTS. That's D-E-R-R-I-C-K. Um, but uh, more so, I'd rather you just follow the brand at OTS Media Co, all social media platforms, uh, OTS Media on YouTube, and uh, the website is otsmediaco.com, where you can check out everything we've got going on. And I would like it if you follow both, so do that, please. Thank you. <laughs> you guys have a wonderful night, and so, well, wonderful day, night, whatever it is, whatever time you're listening. Until next time, guys, take care. Dubs and six. <laughs>